On behalf of Pastor Mark Byers and Kingdom Living, thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. God has one overarching goal in mind prior to Christ's return, and that is to redeem us from all moral and spiritual impurity. Listen to Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. He intends to return for a glorious church. Let's join Pastor Mark and learn more about this blessed hope as he continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. I'm going to show you something about who Israel is. And I'm asking you to not get so convinced I'm way out in left field until you've heard what I have to say. I am convinced Jesus is going to come back. He's going to come into Jerusalem. The Jews are going to receive him as their Messiah. He's going to go out to the Valley of Jezreel and slay all the wicked gathered in that place. All of them. Kings and all the armies. It says the kings and their armies. The rest of the world is untouched. He specifically says who he kills. The rest of the world is untouched. And the saints of God then move out and take the kingdom. All of them. You see, we are called to rule the world. Abraham was promised he would be heir of the world. And we're going to see how often that is conveyed in the scripture. How are we going to rule the world if there's no world to rule over? If everybody's killed that doesn't accept Jesus, and all the saints go up in the rapture, who are these nations that we're going to rule with the rod of iron? Please don't let me blow you away. Please don't think I'm heretical. Please listen till we get to the end of this. When I told you at the beginning this morning that so much of what we have been taught is foolishness, when you start reading the Bible with these concepts, you begin to see things that become very clear. All the sudden verses that didn't make any sense. Wow, now that fits. The second resurrection at the end of the millennium is for the wicked who died during the millennium, the wicked who died prior to the millennium, and if any righteous died during the millennium. You say, wait a minute, people are going to die in the millennium? Listen to this verse. Isaiah 65, 20, clearly in the biblical order of the millennium. No more shall an infant from there live but a few days, nor an old man who has not fulfilled his days. So old men are going to fulfill their days and die. For the child, listen to this, this is a millennium verse. Isaiah 65, 20. Read it for yourself. For the child shall die 100 years old. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The child shall die 100 years old. How can a child die being 100 years old if there's no death in the millennium? Why? Because there is death in the millennium. And the sinner, being 100 years old, shall be accursed. You know what accursed means? Cut off. Executed. There is a second resurrection at the end of the millennium because of the wicked dead and the righteous dead that lived in the millennium and the wicked dead that lived prior to it. We will see all of that as we get into the revelation. In essence, there are three resurrections mentioned in the scripture. 
The first resurrection is Christ who was resurrected and he is the first fruits. And let me just say this, that at his resurrection, there was a whole company of saints resurrected with him according to the book of John. Then there is the resurrection at Christ at his second coming, which is all the saints of all the time. And then there is a third resurrection, which is at the end of the millennium, where everybody who died during the millennium or the wicked who died prior to the millennium are resurrected. Three resurrections. Christ's resurrection and those who were resurrected with him. The resurrection at the second coming or the rapture where the saints of all time are resurrected and the living saints join Christ in the air. And at the end of the millennium, the thousand year period, there is another resurrection. And that is for anybody who died during the millennium and any of the wicked prior to the millennium's beginning. Now, I want to tie this up today. I'm not going to finish everything I wanted to say, but I'm going to tie it up. Turn with me to the book of Psalms, Psalm 96. I want you to see that when God judges the wicked, he is going to put an end to all rule and authority. And I want to show you who does it and how. 1 Corinthians, basically, I want to say this before we read Psalm 96. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 and 24 mentions the three resurrections. It says, Each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ that is coming, then comes the end, which is the end of the millennium, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. At the end, he destroys death. Now, Psalm 96 Verse 6, honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Give to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Give to the Lord glory and strength. Give to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In light of what I just shared with you about Christ coming back and setting up his kingdom over all the nations... Interpret this in light of that. Tremble before him, all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. Let the heavens rejoice and let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in all its fullness. Let the field be joyful in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods will rejoice before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. Jesus has received the responsibility to judge the earth. He claimed so all through the Gospels in Matthew 7, Matthew 13, and Matthew 25. One man put it this way. He is either one of three things. He's either mad, bad, or God. He is either lunatic, liar, or Lord. He is going to judge every single man. He is perfect in his judgment. And he's going to judge every man in light of the light he received. According to the book of Romans... Chapter 1 and verse 20, as well as Romans 2, 12 through 16, there are three areas of judgment. One will be the full light of the gospel. One will be the half light of the commandments of God and the lesser light of creation and conscience. People who have never heard the name of Jesus are going to be judged by what they did in their conscience. How can they be in the rapture? If they are a good person living in the deepest jungles of the Amazon. They have never heard the name of Jesus. But they always chose what was right by conscience sake. You know we have got the gospel down. So that if anybody doesn't receive Jesus as Savior and Lord. Before the second coming they go to hell. Not what the Bible says. When he comes to judge them. He's going to judge them by what they did with their conscience. If they've never heard the Ten Commandments, they've never heard the Gospel, they've never heard anything like this. He's going to judge them by what they did with their conscience. And if they were upright according to their conscience, he will include them as part of the peoples ruled over during the millennial reign. He will build the nations with those people. Saints, 
we are all going to have to give an account of our deeds. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And let me say this. I don't believe God is going to expose all your deeds to all of us. But you and he need to have a talk. He and I need to have a talk. You see, when you commit a sin and you repent of it, he forgives you of your sin, cleans you of unrighteousness. But do you realize it affected your destiny? When you sin, it affects your destiny. And he's going to have to say, Mark, remember the sin that you and I talked about, you repented of, and I forgave you for it? Yes, Master, I do. Well, son, here's the consequence of that sin. Here's what I was going to do for you. Here's what I wanted to do for you. Here's the blessing I wanted to give you. Here's what your reward would have been. But you see, I have to be justified in your eyes for the way I treated you because it was in consequence of what you did. You see, we are forgiven, but consequences are not removed. The idea that there are no consequences to sin is a lie from hell. If you sin, you're forgiven if you repent and confess. But there are consequences to your sin and it doesn't go away. But the problem is we don't know those consequences. So the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to make us all appear and he's going to sit down with us and he's going to say, now I want to show you the consequences so you realize just how just I am and how I treated you. It wasn't that I was being mean. It wasn't that I was withholding blessing. I couldn't bless you because you wouldn't stop sinning. Are you hearing me today? God wants you and me to rule the world. And he's going to have saints rule this world. There are going to be saints who take the kingdom and govern it for him. And when he hands you the job of running the water department of Detroit, instead of governing the state of Michigan, you're going to need to know why. And he's going to have to sit down with you at the judgment seat and unveil all the reasons why. When he judges your works. Once we're done, we then judge the wicked. The book of Revelation chapter 12. The books at the end of the millennium are opened. The books at the judgment seat are opened. All the books. The book of life and the books of people's works. When Corinthians says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. God isn't keeping just a list of your commendable acts. He has to unveil to you the consequence of every evil act. Or you would think he was personally unjust yourself. I had a friend He'd get into trouble all the time and he, things wouldn't go his way. I remember this so distinctly. It used to cause my teeth to go on edge because this was years and years ago. He'd go like this. He'd say, come on, give me a break as he looked up to heaven. Well, I knew there was all sorts of sin going on in the back. Oh, he was repenting. He was forgiving. He was a senior in Bible school one day and he came walking onto campus as drunk as could be. And I saw him first and I went and I got him and I said, what are you doing? He says, I got drunk. So I took him to the president of the school and worked. He punched the president in the mouth. And I had to wrestle him down in the president's office and set on him to subdue this guy. I was a lot bigger than he was. Me and the president and the academic dean are sitting on top of him, trying to hold him down in the president's office. They let him stay in Bible school. But this guy was constantly doing things he shouldn't be doing. And he's looking up to heaven saying all the time, give me a break. When he stands before the Lord and the Lord unveils all the reasons he couldn't give him a break, I think his attitude is going to change. Your destiny depends on what you do today, dear ones. There's a judgment seat of Christ coming. He's going to call every one of us into account. Oh, we're forgiven. David was forgiven, but he still lost four sons. 
he still had war in his house the rest of his days. David was forgiven. He said, my sin is covered. God is forgotten and he's cast it away. Blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, he said. But every day he walked down the road, walking away from Absalom. He knew it was because of what he did. Do you think you could stand before God without any burr in your spirit for everything that's happened in your life? if he didn't unveil to you the judgment of why it had to happen? Some of you are suffering. Today you've suffered the horrible hurt and wound of a divorce. By no means do I ever want to, in any way, make somebody hurt worse than they already hurt over that. Please give me the freedom to illustrate what I'm saying over that. I've sat in my office counseling many people whose marriages have broken up. And I've asked them this question. Were your parents in agreement with that wedding when you first married that person who ran off on you? It is amazing how rare it is to find somebody whose parents was in agreement with the wedding. I've had people say, my goodness, no, they weren't even going to attend the wedding. All my friends told me not to do it. The pastor told me not to do it. My mother and my father told me not to do it. And I still married that one. You see, all of a sudden, when you bring out biblical concepts, all of a sudden they say, oh, my lands. I was in rebellion to even marry that person. I said, yes, don't you realize your folks were trying to stop you from marrying the wrong one and you wouldn't listen to the authority in your life? And I've seen people say, wow. Boy, that makes a lot of sense now. Don't raise your hands, but how many of you that are sitting here today divorced? When your first marriage took place that ended in divorce, did you find opposition from those that were authorities in your life? It's amazing how many that have to raise their hand and say, yes, that was me. At the end, the Lord's going to say, dear ones, I've loved you from the start. You're mine. I've brought you into my kingdom. I purchased you with my blood and I've forgiven you. And you're going to enter into my kingdom forever. But your place in my kingdom has been altered. Because you chose your own way. You didn't choose mine. You chose it here and you chose it here and you chose it here and you chose it there. He is literally, you know, it's so sad. Hear me, young people, hear me. The Lord is going to give the saints the world. Don't give your life for a scrawny little piece of it. The rest of you are here to hear the same thing. God wants to give you and me the world. We look at Mr. Bill Gates worth his billions of dollars. Bill Gates doesn't have anything compared to what God wants to give us. He is going to give the saints of God the kingdom. And he's going to say, go take it, it's yours. Don't give your lives for a scrawny little piece that you picked over the part he wants to give you. You hear me today? Father, I know that you have ordained glorious and wonderful things for everybody who loves you. I know that, Lord. I further know that we have been deceived into believing things about your coming that just simply aren't true. We've also been deceived into believing that we're not going to inherit the earth, like you said. We've been told that the Jews are going to inherit the earth and we're going to inherit heaven. Father, it's very clear in the word that we're going to inherit the earth. You want to give us this world. And yet, Lord, we so are detoured by the lure of the enemy who comes and says, let me give you some of this world. And we bow down to his delicate devices and his delicacies and we, we embrace what he wants us to do to get a little piece of this world when you're wanting to give us the whole thing. Jesus, I'm such a frail man and I, I lack such ability to communicate the glory of what you're attempting to, to instruct us about through the word. 
Father, I feel like I'm a dumb man trying to communicate glorious truth being so ignorant myself that I can hardly get it out. You have promised us the world. But the joy of inheriting the world is that we will rule it with you. That we will be allowed to institute righteousness and truth and justice in the place of wickedness and murder and hate. You want this world to fulfill your intention. And you've ordained that the church be beside you on the throne, ruling and reigning with you over this kingdom for your glory's sake. I ask you that you'll take what I've said today and somehow help these people sort it out. And help me to sort it out even as we get further and further into the teaching. That we be not led astray in any way. Father, I pray that if there's something I've said that is not your way, unveil it to the eyes of this, your congregation of people, and cause us to see that which is right and true. Cause us also to cast aside false concepts and teachings that have so blinded us to what the scripture says that we can hardly absorb the truth of what your word declares. I pray you'll cause this message to be life-giving. Cause the young people and the old alike to set their vision like never before to lay hold of the eternal things and cause these natural things that we are now being offered by the enemy to pale in light of what you're offering us. Father, you've given us things to be enjoyed and you've given us houses and lands. Give us grace not to hold on to them and grasp them, but may we have an open hand willing to let you have whatever you put your finger on. May we hold back nothing from you, O Lord. Prepare us for the coming of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. There's one last verse I want to read to you. Some of you have possibly been amazed that we're going to judge the world, but listen to this. Psalm 149, starting in verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. If you're wondering why praise is so important, here's why. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the peoples. To bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. To execute on them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints. This honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. That's what the psalmist says. It is an honor to be allowed to participate in the execution of judgment on the wicked in this world. And knowing that will cause us to have a spirit of restraint, knowing that the day is not too far ahead when we shall execute judgment, the judgment written, this honor, all of you have. It's an honor. And we're going to need to know that in the days ahead. Amen. The Second Coming Reexamined is our current broadcast series. Join Pastor Mark Byers now as he sheds more light on this vital topic. We are looking at the second coming of Jesus. We looked at who is coming, where is he coming to, how is he coming, and now we're looking at why he's coming. 
And under that topic of why he is coming, we have looked at that he's going to come to complete the saints. He's going to conquer the devil. And we looked at he's going to condemn the ungodly. I want to review briefly and move quickly today because I have some, I believe, wonderful, a wonderful thing to share concerning the next point under why he's coming. But he is going to come to judge the earth. And we human beings are going to be judged on this earth. We're not going to be judged up in heaven. We're going to be judged on the earth. This is where we've lived. This is where we've committed our wickedness. And this is where we are going to be judged. And we saw that we are going to be judged. And he's going to judge all of us on the day of judgment. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, our Father, and the saints all need to be vindicated before all people. He's going to reveal once and for all. Who made the right choices. And human beings are going to be judged by a human being. Psalm 96 says, For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. God has delegated the judgment of the world to the Lord Jesus and to the saints. The Bible says in Acts 17, He has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, referring to Jesus. God has appointed a day, and Jesus is the one appointed to fulfill it. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things that are done according to what he has done, whether good or bad, that which is done in his body. And we also read in Psalm 149, verses 5 to 9, Let the saints be joyful in glory, let them sing aloud on their beds. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance, listen to this, on the nations and punishments on the peoples to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron to execute on them the judgment written, this honor have all his saints. Praise the Lord. During his walk on this earth, Jesus claimed unquestionable authority to judge the world. You can read that in Matthew 7, Matthew 13, and Matthew 25. He says in Matthew 7, He will declare to people, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. In Matthew 25, he says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory. That's not in heaven, that's on earth. This is when He's come. And all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. We're going to see this later. The Lord, after the rapture, he comes back to the earth. It says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. That's important. He will sit on the throne of his glory. How many of you realize where the throne of his glory is? Where's the throne of his glory? Somebody offered to tell me. It's in Jerusalem. Where at? Mount Zion. It says, how many of you realize he will be sitting on the throne of glory in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, right where the Lydiards are worshiping today? It's a wonderful blessing that we have been allowed to associate with those precious people. He will be sitting on the throne. How many of you understand that's after the rapture? Is that true? How can he be sitting on the throne if he's still in heaven? He's going to be sitting on the throne of his glory. The throne which he says is right there. We've already seen that. We can't go into that. And it's then that he gathers the nations and separates the sheep from the goats. That's where the separation of the nations takes place. Goats and sheep are separated. You say, wait a minute, I thought that was the rapture. No, he's already come. He's already sitting on his throne. They come before him at that throne. And now he's separating the nations. How many of you realize there are sheep and goat nations? There are nations that are so ungodly, they're nothing but goats. And I don't believe they'll even be in the millennial reign. God will cut them off. Just like how many of you realize God cut Dan off? From the tribes of Israel. He removed Dan from the tribes. They're not in the book of Revelation. He said they were a serpent. And they were cut off. Because they were so evil. He was cut off from the tribes of Israel. And when you read the 12 tribes in the book of Revelation. Where there were those that were marked by the Holy Spirit. Dan is not included. He's cut off. 
And there will be nations cut off. They won't exist. Quite frankly, I'd like to say to you that I am confident that the United States of America is a sheep nation. And I believe we're going to be in the millennium. This nation will survive and be in the millennium. And when the separation of the nations takes place on that throne and he separates them, I believe the U.S. will survive and he will give us godly leaders over our country. When he judges, he is perfectly qualified to judge. He's done everything he can already to save us, to redeem us. He's done everything he can to bring us in. And if people reject him, he will be qualified to judge because he was first filled with mercy. I believe that people should pray for people before they rebuke people. I think if people would show tremendous intercession at the throne for people before they would open their mouths in their careless rebukes, they might find they would rebuke less and pray more. But I know this, that our Savior has done everything he can to bring us into his kingdom, and he will then have perfect mercy, but perfect justice, because he's done everything beforehand to show mercy. His dual nature as human and God will enable him to institute perfect judgment. Because of his humanity, he will have understanding of our circumstances and our pressures and all the temptations that we face and the pressures that we fight. And he lived as one of us, so he lived without those advantages that we have to live without. And yet he did it without sin. His divinity will give him perfect knowledge. He knows everything, our secret sins, our careless words. He knows all of our motives, our deepest emotions. He knows everything about us. He will be perfectly qualified to pass judgment. And the thing that's amazing about this perfect God who's going to pass perfect judgment, he's going to use us to also judge, but realize that time is after the rapture. We will have been glorified. We too will have the mind of Christ. And our judgment will be perfect. We will not be moved by the anger of the flesh. We will not be moved by any influence of the flesh. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And at that moment, God's going to have people who have been glorified, who have the mind of Christ, and we will only judge as he judges. As we mentioned last week, there are people who are attempting to pass judgment in this society in their own works, with their own hands, with evil acts that are just as evil as the people that are committing the things that they're trying to avenge. We are not called to that, but there will be a day when we will be given the mind of Christ and we will judge with perfect judgment because we will be thinking just like he thinks. There are three different levels of judgment according to the word of God. There's going to be the judgment of the full light of the gospel. Then there's going to be the light of the Ten Commandments. And then there's going to be the light of the creation and the conscience. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of this world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People who have never heard the name of Jesus, never read the Bible, and never even met someone who knew Jesus, are going to be judged because they have the eternal power of the Godhead revealed through nature. Then he says in Romans chapter 2, For as many as have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves who show the work of the law written in their hearts. That's important. When you're witnessing to somebody, make note of this. The law is written on their hearts. They have a witness already in them that you're right. They already know it. You just have to start bringing the law out to stir up that knowledge. Who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. He literally is going to bring to light all the hidden things. And people will say, well, I didn't know. And he's going to bring to light the fact they did know and they did rebel against the law written on their own hearts. It'll be perfect judgment. He will render to everyone according to his deeds, that which we have done while in the body. 1 Corinthians 4 says this, For I know nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, now listen, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness 
and reveal the counsels of the heart. He's going to bring all the hidden things to light. He's going to lay them out. Can you imagine something? Can you imagine reading the life of David and not knowing about Bathsheba? Think of that for a minute. Here's this young man who's just out there taking care of sheep. He gets called by God. He gets anointed by God. He then is raised up by God. He kills Goliath. He becomes promoted by the king. He ultimately becomes the king's son-in-law. The king hates him. He runs for about 13 years in the wilderness trying to escape this king. The presence of God preserves him. He raises him up. He puts him on the throne. And he's a godly, righteous man. And all of a sudden, he has four sons die. And all of a sudden, he has war in his house. But we have no idea about Bathsheba. Don't you think that would be a little confusing? I don't know about you, but I want to reap what I sow. Say, so you do. I sure do. I want to reap the bad things so I learn never to do them again. And I want to reap the good things because I've been working to sow good seed from my youth up. Hopefully I don't sow good seed and reap bad. If we reap what we sow, if we sow good seed, we should reap good seed. If we sow like a Joseph, we should reap like a Joseph. I think the Lord's going to bring the hidden things to light. So we understand why we weren't blessed the way we thought we should be. There are an awful lot of people who literally just can't understand why they go through what they go through. But they never stop to consider that there's a law. A law of faithfulness versus carelessness. So many people have jobs. And they just treat their job like a stepping stone to a newer job. They're waiting for the big break in life. You know something? God's watching how you perform your job. And I don't care if it's flipping hamburgers at McDonald's. He wants to see a faithful person. And if you're faithful with that which is least, what does he say he'll do? He'll give you greater things. And if you're unfaithful with that which is another man's, Luke 16 says he's not going to give you that which is your own. The idea that we are just waiting for the big break is a lie out of hell. God is looking for faithfulness where you're at, doing what you're doing right now. And you're to do it as under the Lord with all your heart. And then if he chooses to bless you and promote you, that's his choice. The Bible makes it clear that all this, these acts are recorded in the books. It's an exhaustive account. It's not a nice little selection of our commendable acts. It's exhaustive. It covers everything, even the motives. Revelation 20, 12 says, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. How many can possibly... Hope to not have a guilty verdict. Who can stand uncondemned in light of that? How would you like to have us say, Behold, the video of Joe's life today on the screen for the last seven days, including his thoughts. None of us would want our lives if all the hidden things were revealed. But I guarantee you when we stand before the Lord, he's going to, in his mercy, have to let us know what caused him to treat us the way he did? God wants to bless us. He's done everything in his power. He's given his life to pour blessing on us. But there's a law. Laws of reaping and sowing. The Bible says there is no creature hidden from his sight. But all things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. He says his eyes are like a flame of fire. They don't miss anything. How many of you realize you have violated your own code of ethics, let alone God's? How many of you have rejected the counsel of your own heart and gone your own way? Everybody, sooner or later, has done what they knew was wrong, and they did it anyway. That's why the Lord says, judge not, that you be not judged. We all are guilty, every one of us. There's not a single person in this room that has not done what you have condemned in others. There's nobody sitting here who hasn't passed judgment on someone else. And you yourself are guilty of the same thing. I remember when Nixon was being impeached. Or the, not impeached, but the Watergate mess. And there was a certain senator who has clearly revealed since he's a snake. 
and he was attacking President Nixon. And I was sitting in a restaurant and I heard somebody railing out against Nixon. And let's face it, what Nixon did, he lied. He was a deceiver. Anybody here never lied? You know, the question we ask is, how many, how many lies do you have to tell before you're a liar? You know, is there a little bell goes off after 15, ding, he's a liar. No, you tell one lie and you're a liar. How much money do you have to steal before you're a thief? If you take a dime that's not yours, you're a thief. These men are accusing Nixon of being liars, and they're liars to the core. What he did was great in their eyes, but their little eyes, the little white lies, didn't matter. God sees all that. He says, we are inexcusable. He says, we who know the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? It's amazing how many Christians think they can just live like the devil in a hellish way, and there's no account for going to be for it. We are clearly condemned by God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none who understands. This is Romans 3. There is none who seeks after God. That's amazing. You did not seek after God. He sought after you. You didn't get all of a sudden spiritual. If you're saved today, it's because God moved on your life. You were incapable. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. The whole human race put together, the Lord says, is totally unprofitable. That's what God's opinion is. There's none who does good. No, not one. Their throat is an open tomb with their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. You know, David was talking about words. Do you realize how often the words in the Bible are likened to swords that kill? We would never kill somebody. No. How often do you use your tongue to slay them? And never even take note of it. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We are all destined for hell unless God intervenes. The human race is sentenced to death and the death is going to be made manifest in the lake of fire, and that is called the second death. We died when Adam died by his rebellion and separation from God, and the final separation will be the lake of fire. Those cast into that place are living dead, separated from God for eternity, separated from all that is good and just and holy and righteous. They're confined. They're literally going to be shut in with the devil, shut in with demons, shut in with those who've rejected God, and shut in with those who love wickedness. What a horrible place to be. And the Bible says they will never see light. And incidentally, I believe we're going to find out that when we study hell later on this year sometime, there'll be no friendship there. In fact, I guarantee you this. The people who are your friends now, if they lead you to hell, will be the people you hate the most then. Because they got you there. People are going to be in hell. And the attitude of heart is, it was him. I tried to go to church, but he dissuaded me. He mocked me and I turned. If I would have just listened to my own heart. I think they're going to be tormented. Body and soul, according to the scripture. Unendingly in this lake of fire. In agony and frustration. Realizing they wasted every opportunity to turn. And accept the Lord as Savior. And embrace his kingdom. I think one of the most tormenting thoughts of hell is going to be, they're going to be saying to themselves, if only, if only, if only, if only I would have listened. The smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Revelation 14, 11. I can't go into this, but I had an experience where I was put out, and I didn't want to be put out, but they decided that I should go under gas, and they gassed me and put me out for a tooth surgery that I was having when I was a young Bible school student. And in that period of being out, I took a little visit to hell. I was a Christian. I knew I didn't belong there. But I was there as real as could be. And I can guarantee you this, the thing that struck me the most was the utter hopelessness. The utter, utter hopelessness. 
of that place. Revelation chapter 20, I'd like you to turn there. I want to read about 10 verses. I want you to get a flavor of what the Lord Jesus has saved us from. This is what we are worthy of, all of us. Everyone in this room is worthy of this. We are all guilty according to the word of God. Revelation chapter 20, starting in verse 5. But the rest of the dead, this is at the end of the millennium, did not live again until the thousand years were accomplished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who are reigning with Jesus Christ and are raptured and changed into incorruptible and immortal bodies and souls, they're going to reign with Christ. The second death has no power. That's why it's so important now to make sure your life is lined up with God. Second death has no power over the person who goes through the rapture. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison. You have to understand something. In this thousand year reign of Christ, there's going to be people born. We're going to look at this all later on. They're going to be, we mentioned it last week. I gave you a verse last week. But there's going to be people born. The nations are going to still be here. There's going to be natural people living on this earth. And at the end of that time, they're going to have lived 1,000 years under the reign of the perfect king and the whole time despising it you know what god's going to reveal to the nations into the world into the universe principalities and powers alike that the devil isn't our problem we are our problem and when he's chained and bound in hell for a thousand years having not a single ounce of influence People will still love unrighteousness. And the moment he's released for a season, they're going to flock to him to try to overthrow the bondage of being under the covering of the authority of God. It goes on and says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Can you imagine a multitude as the sand of the sea, having just lived for a thousand years under the rulership of Jesus Christ, will rebel the moment they have an opportunity? The same devil that caused a third of the angels to rebel in heaven will deceive the nations to do the same thing. They went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. They're literally going to attack Jerusalem again. They're going to surround it. They think they're going to put it to an end. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The father says, enough! I'm getting rid of them permanently. And he casts fire from heaven and all the wicked are consumed. And the devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they've been there a thousand years. And they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat under it and whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no place found for them and I saw the dead small and great standing before God and the books were opened and another book was opened the book of life and the dead were judged according to the works and by the things which were written in the books the sea gave up the dead who were in it and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them and they were judged each one according to his works then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire this is the second death and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire people say oh well the lake of fire that's just figurative language well, I don't think it is, but maybe it is. Maybe it is figurative. But let me just say this. The only way John could describe what he saw was to describe a lake of fire with people in it. I don't care if it is or isn't figurative. It is so horrible that the only way to describe it is a lake of burning fire where people never die. And the Lord said, do whatever you got to do not to go there. Cut off your hand, poke out your eye, but do whatever you've got to do not to go to hell. People play with the idea that hell is some little game where we're going to go down there and have drinking parties with our buddies. They won't even get a drop of water, according to the word of God. Jesus said, fear him who can kill body and put soul in hell. People think they're going to get away with their actions. They're not. Nobody is. We're going to be called into an account. We welcome you to Kingdom Living with Pastor Mark Byers. 
Let's get right to today's message as Pastor Mark continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. And the devil who deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they've been there a thousand years. And they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it and whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead small and great standing before God. And the books were open and another book was open, the book of life. And the dead were judged according to the works and by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. And death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. People say, oh, well, the lake of fire, that's just figurative language. Well, I don't think it is, but maybe it is. Maybe it is figurative. But let me just say this. The only way John could describe what he saw was to describe a lake of fire with people in it. I don't care if it is or isn't figurative. It is so horrible that the only way to describe it is a lake of burning fire where people never die. And the Lord said, do whatever you got to do not to go there. Cut off your hand, poke out your eye, but do whatever you've got to do not to go to hell. People play with the idea that hell is some little game where we're going to go down there and have drinking parties with our buddies. They won't even get a drop of water, according to the word of God. Jesus said, fear him who can kill body and put soul in hell. People think they're going to get away with their actions. They're not. Nobody is. We're going to be called into an account. Jesus suffered and died the ignoble death on the cross to save us from that place. And the hope Revelation chapter 20, verses 12 to 15, reveal that there is a book called the book of life. And if your name is found in that book, we will be acquitted. We will escape the second death. If your name is not in that book, you go to the lake of fire. That book is not just mentioned in Revelation. It's mentioned all through the word of God. It's mentioned in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 32. And this is an amazing verse. Exodus chapter 32, 32 and 33. Yet now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, I pray blot me out of your book, which you have written. And the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. How many of you know Adam was alive at one point and died? How many of you realize Adam had eternal life and lost it? How many of you realize the Israelites were under the covering of the blood from the sacrifice of the lamb and God came out and he says, I'm taking their names out of the book. This book has been around since the beginning of the world. According to Revelation 17, 8, from the foundation of the world. The book is there. Philippians chapter 4, 3 says, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Revelation mentions it more often than any other book. The book of life. Psalms mentions it. And every time it's mentioned in the Old Testament, the mention gives the concept of the names being removed. The idea that once you're saved, you're always saved, is a lie from hell. To deceive people into accepting a lifestyle that will lead them there. Revelation 3, 5 says, He who overcomes will be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, if he overcomes. But I will confess his name before my Father and his angels. All through the book of Revelation. Revelation 13, Revelation 17, Revelation 21, Revelation 22. In 22, he literally says, If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. Can you fathom that? If we tamper with the book of Revelation, God says, I'll take your name out of the book of life. There are those who don't believe John wrote Revelation because the style of the book is so different from the book of John and the book of 1st and 2nd and 3rd John. The literary style is much more basic and, and it doesn't have the flowery presentation of John the gospel. Well, let me tell you why I think that happened. I think John was writing down, he was told, what you see, write. And he's writing his feet. Can you imagine? Everything you see, write down. 
Just try to follow me today by writing everything I say down. Your notes are going to be a mess. But when John was all done, the Lord instant says, now anybody who tampers with this book, I'm taking his name out of the book of life. I don't think he edited it. I think he left it right the way it was. God gave his approbation to it and said, now, that's fine. Don't touch it, John. And anybody who does, I'm removing their name from the book of life. It's not a wonder the book doesn't appear as literary as John does. How do you get your names recorded in that book? It's very simple. You submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Not accept Jesus as savior. Not some little silly decision card. You submit to the lordship of Jesus. He becomes your lord, your king, your god. And you give up the rights to your life. You're not your own anymore. You accept that you're bought with the price of his blood. We commit our lives to him by faith. We trust his righteousness to be put to our account. We no longer trust our good works whatsoever. We acknowledge that there aren't any such things. We believe he gives us his righteousness. And we live by faith. Which simply means we hear God's word, we believe God's word, and we obey God's word. Believing and obeying are interestingly used interchangeably in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews 3, 18 19, it says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Disobedience and unbelief are the same thing. Anybody who says, I believe, and then disobeys is lying. They don't believe. Because if you believe, the scripture says you obey. This book of life Having our names written in it is confirmed that they're there because we have deeds. It's not a single step where we step out and say, I believe Jesus to be my Savior. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. What it is, it's a life of faithfulness. It's interesting. In both Hebrew and Greek, the word faith and faithfulness are the same word. The just shall live by faith. That means that those whom God declares to be righteous will be faithful. If you're going to live by faith, you are living by faithfulness. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faithfulness. Hebrews 10 says, If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition. The Old Testament heroes, according to Hebrews 11, 13, all died still living in faith, not having received the promise. It is possible to make shipwreck of our faith according to 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20. It's possible for our names to be blotted out of this book. Only those who remain faithful, who overcome all the pressures to disobey, all the pressures to go the way of the world, all the pressures to come under the authority of the satanic kingdom, they are the ones whose names are going to stay in the book of life. They will be acquitted at the judgment seat. To use the Roman word, they will be justified. That's the Roman court word. Not because they're innocent, but because they have consistently trusted Jesus for Savior. Consistently trusted that the penalty that they deserve was passed on him. Only the Lord can justify us through the blood of Christ. Both justice and mercy were fully provided at Calvary. With the day of judgment over, the stage is set for the redemption of this creation. After all this judgment, and the book of life has been opened, and those written are acquitted, and, and now the kingdom has been established. God is going to redeem the whole creation. He will create a new heavens and a new earth. That's at the end of the millennium. But at the beginning of the millennium, he's going to come, and he's going to complete the saints. And then after he completes the saints, he's going to conquer the devil. And you say, well, the devil's already conquered. Yes, but as we already said, he is allowing the wheat and the tares to grow together until the time of the end. He made the choice. After he has conquered the devil and put him in prison, and he has condemned the ungodly, he has some other things that he has to do. I would like to read to you from Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, the famous Daniel 70 weeks chapter. You can turn there if you want. Daniel 9, 24. I'm not going into that section today. Quite frankly, I'm not sure how far we'll get into it ever, but I suspect we will probably address the 70th week of Daniel, the week that never was. That's a good name for it. 
But in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, when the whole concept of the 70 weeks is introduced, it says, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. And then notice what he says those weeks are going to accomplish. To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Are you aware with me that he did the first three of those at Calvary during his life 2,000 years ago? What did he do? He finished transgression, he made an end of sin, and he made reconciliation for iniquity. He brought sin and sacrifice together, and he brought an end to those things. But the second part... It says he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness. He's going to seal up vision and prophecy. And he's going to anoint the most holy. You have to realize when Jesus comes back the second time, there are some things he must do. This is three of them. Bring in everlasting righteousness. Seal up vision and prophecy. And anoint the most holy. I'd like to talk the rest of this morning about one prophecy he's got to finish and seal up. And that's the fourth thing that is the reason why he's coming. And that is, he's coming to consummate his marriage. He's coming to consummate his marriage. You may be surprised to find out that the Bible never specifically uses the phrase, we are the bride of Christ. That phrase is never used. However, it clearly reveals that we are called to be his bride. We are called to a wedding. We are called to attend the wedding that will be performed at the second coming of Christ. John the Baptist was the one chosen to reveal Jesus to the nations. And he said this, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. John had a sense his life was about over. He knew that his purpose was to introduce the bridegroom to the bride. Jesus spoke a number of parables, and turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 21, and I'm going to show you some of these things that Jesus brought out concerning himself using parables, and he has illustrated to us beyond any doubt that he is the bridegroom who is coming back for his bride. I want to go back to chapter 21, starting in verse 28 to 32. I want to just quickly run through these. We've got to move quickly, but I want to show you that these parables are leading up to, it's a whole context of teaching that leads up to Jesus making some powerful statements. He said, what do you think? A man had two sons and he came to the first and said, son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterward, he regretted it and went. Then he came to the second and said, likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? And he's talking to the Pharisees. And they said to him, the first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him, and when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe in him. Then he tells the second parable right away. Here another parable. Can you imagine? He just just punched them in the mouth. Just think what he said to those Jews. He said... Tax collectors and harlots are going to receive the kingdom, and you aren't. When we read a little bit further, you're going to see their response. Then he says, hear another parable. (laughs) You don't like that one? Listen to this one. There was a certain landowner who planted a vineyard and set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a tower. And he leased it to vine dressers and went into a far country. Let me assure you of something. The Old Testament talks about this vine dressing vineyard and he says what else could i have possibly done that i haven't done and he clearly is talking to israel now when vintage time drew near he sent his servants to the vine dressers that they might receive its fruit and the vine dressers took his servants beat one killed another and stoned another and again he sent other servants more than the first and they did likewise to them then last of all he sent his son to them saying they will respect my son are you getting the picture of who he's talking about here But when the vine dressers saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him and seize his inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine dressers? It's amazing what he did. He let them pronounce their own judgment. What's the vine dresser going to do to these 
evil men. Kind of like David, you know, and Nathan's telling the story. The man who did that is going to pay fourfold and he's going to die. You're the man. David repented and Nathan came back and said, because you repented, you will not die. But he paid fourfold. He lost four sons. And he was forgiven. You see, sin has consequences. Always. They said to him, he will destroy those wicked men miserably. (laughs) They really, he'll destroy those wicked men miserably. In other words, He'll do it in a horrible way. Read Josephus' account of 70 AD. And you will read one of the most horrible descriptions of the destruction of a city you can possibly comprehend. The mothers in Israel, in that city, were eating their own children before the conquest was over. These same Jews who he looked at and said, you're the ones were literally eating their own children within 40 years of this statement. It was a horrible, horrible thing. He will destroy those wicked men miserably and lease his vineyard to other vine dressers who will render him the fruits of their seasons. And Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it was marvelous in his eyes. Do you know when they rejected him and when he became the chief cornerstone? Brother Jim just shared this on Wednesday night. At the resurrection after the cross. Therefore I say to you, now listen to what he says. The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Now when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking of them. How perceptive. (laughs) But when they sought to lay hands on them, they feared the multitudes because they took him for a prophet. They literally wanted to kill him right then. Because he had just told them, I'm taking the kingdom from you. And Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Listen to that. That's the key. There is a marriage for the son. And the father is the king who is arranging a marriage for the son. The kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son, sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. How many of you know that the Jews were the ones called? They were the chosen people. They were the elect. I believe that the elect are people who God, literally there's a company of the elect and there's a company of those who have rejected the gospel. And the elect, they were the Jews. And he calls them. And he said, we're not coming. Of course, you can't backslide. Can't lose out. Again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I prepared my dinner. This king's pretty patient. I wouldn't have sent out the second time. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their own ways. One to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his servants, treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out his armies, destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. That's exactly what happened in 70 AD. He destroyed them and burned up their city. Burned it to the ground. It is laying in rubbles to this day because of what happened then. He said not one stone will be left on another. Just two chapters later, in this same series of context, he says not a stone is going to be left. And there wasn't. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways, and as many as you find, invite to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found. Anybody who would respond... Both bad and good. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. What is the Lord preparing us for? A wedding. Chapter 22 is the introduction to that. Matthew 25. Turn over just a couple chapters. I'll read just four verses quickly out of the story of the virgins, the parable of the virgins. Verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. These people are waiting for a wedding. 
Verse 5, but while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Let me tell you something. It isn't how you live thinking Jesus can come back any second. It's how you live if he doesn't come back when he's expected. The idea that we've got to live on the edge of our seats. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Make sure you live right. Jesus is coming back. And it is cruel and unreasonable punishment to teach little children that they're going to miss the rapture and their mommy and daddy are going to wake up one day and they're gone. Don't worry. It's not going to happen that way. He says, while the bridegroom was laid, they all slumbered and slept. Verse 6. And at midnight a cry was heard. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. And of course, we know they didn't have all the oil. And verse 10 says, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. What is he saying? There's a wedding. You can read in Revelation chapter 19, verses 5 to 9. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, as in the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. You just can't expect God to do what he's told you to do. You're going to be making yourself ready. You're going to be buying oil, which is the anointing. You're going to be paying the price, separating yourself from the busyness of this life to get anointing so that when the times come, we are ready. Let us be glad and rejoice, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. 21, 2 of Revelation. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 21, 9 to 12. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And he showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. And also she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates. And the names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. It's pretty clear where this Jerusalem is going to be, right in Israel. Revelation twenty two seventeen 17, of the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Jesus is coming back for a lot of political reasons. We're going to look at those political reasons. He's going to conquer the world. He's going to rule the world. He is going to set up a kingdom. And we're going to look at that in detail. He is going to establish Israel. And we are going to spend a number of weeks making sure you understand what that means. One of the reasons why there is confusion on end time doctrine is we have created in the Gentilized church two Israels. There is only one. And so the Gentilized church who has created the two Israels can't understand that the Israel ruling the earth is the same Israel that's the heavenly Jerusalem. Because they've separated them with their error in dispensationalism. I agree there are covenants that God has made, but each covenant in the scripture builds on the next covenant and they all are in agreement. The political aspects, he's coming to set the world in order, yes. But the heart of Jesus is not set on the political issues. I'm sure he wants to bring an end to this craziness, this murder, this deceit, this ungodliness. He's going to bring an end to abortion. And he's going to bring an end to corrupt governments. He's going to bring an end to evil leaders. There will no longer be the Saddam Husseins to be dealt with. He's going to end them all. Set up his kingdom. People say, that's just too hard to believe. Well, he's done it once before. When God was done, let me just warn you about something. When God was done judging the world the last time, there were eight people left. He doesn't need a whole host to fulfill his purpose. Just a few. 
He does rule the heavens and the earth right now. But he is going to manifest that rulership on earth. But his attention, his heart, is on the personal aspects of his coming. He is looking to the wedding. Thank you.